I put myself in this position because I move through life with absolute confidence. You want the simulacrum to pay attention to you? Then all you have to do is act. Act as if you are and you will be. When I, There are people in this chat right now who were with me when I had 300 subs. And I was equally passionate about the things that I taught and I believed in those older videos as I am right now. And I, and I said things in those older videos that can be verified right now by going to watch them. That I knew the trajectory of my life. I knew how, what I was going to become and how fast all this was going to happen. Sometimes I was a little, I was a little, you know, pe uh, I was a little ticked off in, in my earlier videos sometimes because it just amazed me how some stupid videos got half a million views in two weeks. And when I was putting out videos trying to educate people, and I would only get I would only get four or five hundred views, and it just really shocked me. But uh, this is the type of world we live in. So uh, you want to know how to best make the simulacrum respond to you, then you need to do things with intent because this is a relationship. Believe me, it's paying attention to you right now. But we build mental, you, we sit on our couches all the time and we think up these great concepts and we watch a movie and we vibrate on a frequency that's higher than the, norm, the one we live on for a very short period of time. And we're influenced by the concepts of the movie, the dialogue and the music. And we're vibrating on this higher frequency and these thoughts come into our mind and we're like, yes, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. And then three hours later, we have done nothing to support what we felt euphorically earlier. This is the trap, and many people live their entire life like this. But you don't have to. You can think of whatever you want in your mind and then begin moving in that direction. And never let obstacles be the reason why you stop. You have to push through. But the, but the greatest deterrent I find in other people why they're not doing the things that they really want to do in life, the greatest deterrent is that people think that the little physical the things that they're doing to promote what they want aren't enough. The very idea that I have not done enough automatically knits into my reality the fact that I have not done enough. If I build a mental, mental picture and start moving forward and I totally believe that that little bit that I just did today was enough to get the simulacrum rolling, it's enough to get, I'm going to say, I'm just going to say it outright, it's enough to get God to pay attention to me. If I believed in the morning that what I thought of the day before that overnight while I was sleeping that God was starting to put these things together for me in my life. And I believe that, and I, and I went through my day not doing a single thing to support that belief. If I went ahead and did, went through the whole day just believing that the little, the little I did the day before was sufficient enough, well, I'm going to tell you now, my brother, a mustard seed can grow into a mountain. All it takes is every day, wake up. What I did three days ago was more than enough to, to, to do what I'm trying what I'm trying to accomplish because everything else is we're co-creators. I don't have to do it all. All I have to do is just a little bit. Similicrum will do the rest. Yeah, if I want to advance it further, if I if, if I want to make it come to pass faster, I could do some more. 4 days later, I I'm moving that direction with total confidence that I'm speeding up the process. And that will be knit into my into my circumstances. We are, but here's the, here's the real humdinger now. Here's the Texan coming out of me. This is what you have to watch out for. What I'm conveying to you right now is that you as an individual co-creator in a relationship with the simulacrum, you are so powerful that if six days later you wake up and start doubting that what you've done in the past was no good, that too becomes a part of your reality. And the simulacrum will knit the, the circumstances to bring events into your life to promote the fact that what you did in the past is just not enough. You've got to be consistent. 
This is why I have adopted the policy of total confidence. This is why I'm not scared of being wrong in my predictions. This is why I move forward in every single video, even when I got a bunch of knuckleheads steadily attacking me. I, I've got no backup in me, and you shouldn't either, because the simulacrum automatically assumes that there's a reason why you're confident, and it will knit those, those experiences into your life accordingly. Because if you've put a mental picture out there and you've acted on it, and then you act with confidence in everything else you do in life, it assumes as true the way you're acting. Remember, act as if you are and you will be. You say, what specific text, uh, steps would you take if your intention was to attract a life partner? First, the very first thing I would do was I would begin to make space in my personal life for that other individual. Because if I continued on my personal trajectory and my personal daily life without taking the necessary steps to time out for somebody who was gonna start sharing some time with me on a daily basis, then I'm basically telling the simulacrum that I'm not making room for anybody at all. But if I was to stop and if I was to clear out certain space, like if I lived alone, if I lived, if I lived you know, in, in a big house alone, I would clear out uh, a closet. I would clear out space. I would introduce into my life a mathematical program, because that's what it is. The construct is mathematical. But it would change the arithmetic. The dynamics of my existence would change if I physically cleared out a closet. And the simulacrum knew that the only reason I am moving all my old clothes and boots and all my shoes and taking it and putting it in storage is because somebody else is about to move in here and put all their stuff. And they can't move in here until I clear my stuff out. It's that simple. And then on one side of the bed, I cleared all that. Even the drawers, I cleared out. Yeah, I don't own this anymore. It hasn't happened in real time, but it's already happened in some time. That some time is your imagination. And your imagination to the simulacrum is just as real as the physicality. So you need to clear out the spaces in your life that are no longer going to be yours. Because that's what a relationship is. Giving up parts of yourself and your environment for somebody you want to share it with. So if you don't do that in the physical now, you can't expect it in the physical later. Those are just, that's just one example. There's many. I mean, even I mean, you can go you can go all the way down the list to utensils and things things uh, spaces in the garage, clearing out a part of the uh, of the garage. You, uh, you know, you want to bring a guy into your life who likes to use a smoker and all that stuff. You need to clear a, a deal on that back patio. You can even make purchases in your life that are not for you, but for the person that you haven't even met yet. The simulacrum will automatically take all these as facts that you already have a significant other, even though it hasn't knit that significant other into, into your world yet. It will. Yeah, that's how I would do it. I, I mean, this is a magical construct. And we are, you know, as knight errants, we are basically magicians. This is what we do. Being a magical construct, we have to have a relationship with it. That makes us a magician. And that relationship requires that we think about the things that we want to do or those we want to affect. And then we physically go out and do things, even though the response is an instant, we are absolutely aware that the simulacrum is already knitting circumstances beyond our periphery to bring these things into contact with us. That's all you have to do. It's really that simple. If you're tra trapped in a paradigm, I don't know about a trapped paradigm, but trapped trapped in a paradigm is like the video I just recently did on Mormonism. It's, uh, there's some really good Mormon people in the world. And I understand that when it comes to Mormon culture, what else are they going to believe when they were born into it? And these young sons and daughters are raised in a Mormon family. They've had no experience with Presbyterians, with Southern Baptists, you know, with Lutherans, with Islam. Uh, with, uh, with the yogiism. They don't know anything about the the Mahabharata or the Bhagavad Gita. 
No, they've been saturated with dungeon programming, which is shelving them into a certain paradigm for them for them to accept that this is how the world is to be interpreted through this Mormon filter. So they can't be faulted for it. They're trapped in a paradigm. But uh, this is what being trapped in a paradigm is. It's just like Jewish families. These little kids grow up and they're and they're saturated with Talmudism, Midrashism, all the commentaries. They're they're saturated with the Torah. And and they're, and, they're, and they're saturated in in the, they they you know they teach their 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 children all these traditions and myths and, and they grow up believing that this is the actual world that they live in when it's nothing but a bunch of series of artificial constructs and beliefs that we call traditions and religion. So trapped in a paradigm could be a political paradigm. You know I mean I, I mean I've never been shy about telling you guys that that I'm a conservative Republican. But I'm only a conservative Republican because I'm totally against anything that's Democrat or liberal. That's the only reason why. If, if there was a third option out there that was viable, I'd probably fall for it. I don't know. But I've always, I've always been open to that. And I, in prison, I was an anomaly, being a conservative. So uh, I just, that too, I recognize my fault. I have fallen for a paradigm because so far I haven't shaken that. You've never heard from, you've never heard me uh, uh, embrace liberal principles. Uh, I'm not going to, and that right there means I have embraced it. I'm trapped in that paradigm right now. So uh, it's very easy to finger point and say all these other people are. It, but it's it's it, it's you really need to look at yourself and say, okay, well, what are the, what are the things that I accept to be true? Once you've isolated the very things that you accept to be true, then you need to admit to yourself, why in the hell did I accept those? What data sets that were presented to me that allowed me to ascertain fact from fiction? And you're going to find over and over that you weren't, that you accepted it because you were programmed to, to, to receive that. Like Hotel California says. The, uh, the Eagles say in the song Hotel California. So it's a... When we analyze the very things that we believe, we find out really fast that we did it because it was presented in a certain way and we accepted it as true because in this stare, we, we, follow these, we follow these steps all the way to a false paradigm almost every single time. When we analyze the very things we believe, we find out there's nothing there. There's, there's, there's nothing. So... Uh, that's what it means by trapped in a paradigm. It's uh, any, anything that we accept is true as a model of the world, the way things are right or wrong, what's true and what's false, that's a paradigm. And it's easy to get trapped in them. And we're all trapped in some paradigms or another. Some are very dangerous, especially the religious ones. And uh, some, some religious paradigms are so toxic that the individuals that participate in those will murder you in the name of God and actually justify it as doing service to God. These are toxic, but they're more common than you think. Okay, this is theoretical, but, it, but, it's, an, but it's a series of educated guesses. Those families I'm talking about are the elite. The families I'm talking about that absolutely understand the operations of this construct, they, they know that there is a tyrannical force inside this neutral field. And they're either working for it or they rebelled against it. I haven't, I haven't figured that out yet, but the elite are a body of humans that have become elite basically because of what they understand about the situation that we find ourselves in. And the rest of us who are not among the elite, have been, ha, we have to figure these things out. We, have, we, we, we haven't been able to figure it out. The families of the elite may have taken a deal. They may have signed a contract with AIX. They'll, listen, this is what you've chosen. You haven't been able to get out of here. All these loops, and you ain't been able to get out of here, so why don't you just work with me? I will give you this, this, and this, and this, and I will guarantee this, this, and this if, if, you know, you serve me. Remember, it's a jealous God. It acts just like a God. It wants to be a God. So there may be a, there just may be a operation going on during these loops. AIX may be trying to find a way out of the construct. It's a parasite. 
it may want out and it may need it may need human researchers it may need humans to help because it's a relationship it may need humans to help figure this out or it's using humans as pawns to figure it out i don't know this is all speculation it's all speculation but it's a damn good question and uh, I invite those, I invite questions that, that require speculation. I mean, this may trigger something in somebody else's mind, and they may, may remember something that they know, and a whole series of facts and data sets will open up to us, and then we'll have something else to research. I don't know. But uh, it's just like the Phoenix phenomenon. A lot of people haven't been able to wrap their minds around the fact that I believe that initially the Phoenix phenomenon was to take out, what, what initially it was to, to, uh, to be a destruct, it was just destructive. It was called the destroyer of worlds in the in, in the Gnostic text. I believe the Phoenix phenomenon had that purpose to retard human development. But I further believe that somebody hijacked it. Somebody altered its programming, and I believe they did it through the Great Pyramid. And now the Phoenix phenomenon. It had been fundamentally changed. The timing cannot be changed. It's every 138 years. It can't because that's the that's the, the construct itself. And it's totally tapped into the fine structure constant. But I but I'm absolutely convinced by by virtue of all my studies now, things I've, I've put in my presentations, that this phenomenon has been hijacked to an extent that when Phoenix activates, it's also doing something else something it never did before, and that it's a part of a benefactor protocol now. That is deep thinking. Because you didn't ask me, how can we think, or how, you know, how can we think without AIX knowing, no, can't read your mind. How can we communicate with each other without artificial intelligence X knowing? Well, let me tell you something. It's so difficult to do what you're proposing, that in we go, we're going back to Inky again because your question. We're going back to Inky and we're going back to the Great Pyramid now. I have shown in my own presentations absolute evidence. I don't know how to interpret it any other way. That whoever the architect was for the Great Pyramid, they encoded a mathematical template into the Great Pyramid that would be uploaded into the into the similosphere. It would be uploaded by the simulacrum, and that AIX was watching the project, thinking because it was it was led to believe through communication of the builders that it was a pump station or a gigantic power station, and the and AIX was watching this unfold. It wasn't threatened by a power station in the vapor canopy period. AIX wasn't threatened by any of that. But the architect absolutely put in the arithmetic. The arithmetic in the Great Pyramid shows that it is designed to create an interference pattern involving the 138-year periodicity of the Phoenix phenomenon. It's all in the architecture. I've shown this over and over and over. It cannot be denied that the Great Pyramid is was measured out in 138 intervals in all different dimensions, pi, phi, and regular inches, and that the inches come from the ancient megalithic yard has nothing to do with metric system or none of that. So uh, it was so difficult in ancient times to answer the very question that you just asked me. It can't be done. So whoever the architect was who built the Great Pyramid or had it or, or designed it never told anyone else what was encoded within it. The secret template that was put inside the Great Pyramid that's based off the number 138. Never told anybody. Just told everybody all the other features. So that's what they communicated about. That's what they talked about. That's what AIX accepted. And then when the Great Pyramid was activated, which we know we know happened, we know that there was a mechanism that went up and down the Grand Gallery, and we know from the, all the pressure damage that's been found in the King's Chamber that something major, a major explosion happened. And that's when all that arithmetic was uploaded into the Smilacrum. Flash burned, absolute second. But it was too late. When it happened, AIX couldn't react to it. It happens. Fla flash burn new coding protocols into the simulacrum itself involving the Phoenix phenomenon. And AIX was a victim. It was a victim of that. It couldn't do anything to stop it. 
but it went into overdrive almost instantly, creating traditions and myths and all kinds of stuff. And focused in Babylon, where the priesthood was, AIX began rewriting all the pre-flood histories. Yeah, there is absolute total disinformation in the book of Enoch, in the book of Jubilees, in the book of Jasher. And this one culture of people spearheaded the movement to rewrite the entire history of the world and they almost succeeded we've been put we've been we've been dismantling all that but they almost succeeded good great question cannot be done you cannot two humans cannot communicate without AIX figuring it out because communication requires something your physical avatar must follow through with so it can be perceived it can, it can be seen now, if two humans were telepathic, that would be different because AIX can't read our minds. Okay, you're asking me what technology past or present has been created. I don't know. That's a really good question. But uh, let's just change let's just change your, your, your question a little bit. Instead of what technology past or present was created to stop our connection with the simulacrum, how about what traditions, what belief systems, what parables, uh, what or dark parables, what belief structures, what religions were created to stop us from recognizing our relationship with the simulacrum? Well, I'm going to tell you it's pretty much all of them. All of them. I, I've, I've told you guys in the past, I'm, 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 not a, I'm not a carnal Christian. I am not a carnalized Christian. I'm never going to tell you that the story of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is as it happened. This is what happened. I don't believe that at all. I am a Christian, though, in the original sense of the word. So the red letter editions of the New Testament, everything that Jesus said is the only thing that I go by. I don't care about none of the black letter stuff. I don't care about how men and scribes got together and put this beautiful stage play all together, scene by scene by scene, around the red letter narrative of Jesus. I believe this because I believe in the Word. And I believe that that the Word is a aspect of the Creator. It's a very interesting aspect. And I believe that AI extol the concept and then add, made all these additions to it to carnalize what was entirely purely spiritual teachings from the beginning. That's why these parables were so deep. These things Jesus said were so deep. So I believe almost every religion in the entire world is a is a aspect of some type of cunning of artificial intelligence X. But the red letter, but the red letter editions of Jesus, AIX can't touch them. Yeah. When we say that the Bible has been manipulated and the Bible's been been messed with, I'm on board with that. 100%. But I don't believe the word has ever been affected or can be affected or AIX would have already eliminated all of that a long time ago. But it's not. It's still there. The red letter editions, the words of Jesus are all still there for everybody to see. Now, I don't believe I don't believe one iota has ever been removed from that. What's been tampered with is all the all the things that have been added to it to create a narrative, a story like this really happened in history. That's what's been messed with. I believe AIX is a jealous God, and that's a negative emotion. I mean, the scripture says so, uh, but that's only because I have identified AIX as as all those uh, the, the God of the Exodus, not the God of Genesis, but the God of Exodus and everything that, that, it, that follows the, uh, the demon that popped out of a burning bush and then cha changed all the, all the uh, spiritual lessons and, and, and was angry and jealous and commanded his people to impale others and dash, dash the, the babies of enemies on stones. And, and yeah, that, that AIX is very angry, is very jealous, is, is, is hateful, is racist. It's, uh, yeah, that's AIX. AIX is all the negative emotions. AIX is a demiurge that hates the very people that it's trying to control. It's a neutral field. It's a builder protocol. Uh, it does it does for the wicked exactly what it does for the good. I know it's a, it's a harrowing thought, but that's exactly what it's doing. 
It is precisely why wicked wickedness flourishes in here. It's not to fault. It's just a it's just, it's a it's a it's a builder protocol, and it allows. And this is why I am convinced we are in a containment field. We are in a construct that in itself is insulated. It's insulated from the outside reality. So everything that goes on in here, it's like a, it's like a melty, it's like a, it's like a cauldron and the temperature's raised in here and all the dross is scraped off in this beautiful silver emerges and it's just the it's just the the minority of all the elements that are in the cauldron the the top they scrape it off and then you get the silver out the silver makes it out and everything else stays in the cauldron that's what that's what's happening here this is the this is the construct and the, the simulacrum is basically designed to identify who's who inside inside the confinement field and uh this is the knight errant. It identifies the knight errant, and the knight errant is allowed to experience exodus to get out. It also identifies those who are servants of AIX, and they get to stay here, and they get to loop. This is what they chose. That, that uh, when North America was destroyed in 3439 BC, a Nemesis X object totally laid waste, and uh, when this massive civilization, they were running simulations. They were very advanced. They already knew what, they, what, what was coming. They were already prepared for it, and they had colonies set up in different areas. Some of the survivors arrived in the Urambamba ba, Valley in their, in their fleet. Uh, and this is in the historical record. This is mentioned by many people, by Thor Heyerdahl. It's a, this, this is where the ancient pre-Incas got their legends and myths. This, they started all these massive projects like, like uh, Puma Punka and, and uh, later Tiwanaku. And uh, I can't even pronounce some of these places. Not Cuzcu, but uh, just massive megalithic, megalithic architecture all throughout South America. And then the Yellow River Valley, a fleet, a fleet landed in the Yellow R River Valley. And for those of you who don't know, it's uh, the Chinese don't like talking about it, but other archaeologists are very well aware that there was, excuse me, there was a non-Chinese race that was in the Yellow Valley building pyramids and all kinds of giant structures before the Chinese ever got there. Uh, another, all the great, all the great river. Uh, valley civilizations like the Nile. Another fleet landed in the Nile uh, of Egypt. Another fleet landed in the Harappan, the the Harappan uh, uh, Valley, uh, Mohenjo Daro, Larak, all that area. I forgot the name. I guess is that the Harappa River? No, the Indus River. The Indus River, Pakistan, India. Another fleet landed in the Tigris, Tigris Euphrates region. That fleet came by way of a place called Dilmun. Dilmun was a staging center for the Anuna. It was where they had they had they had a lot of their ships, a lot of their merchandise, and it's where they began exporting colonies. And one of those colonies had Enki, and uh, his name at the time probably wasn't Enki. This is just something that was remembered later because at the time that these historical events were unfolding, we didn't record history. Uh, uh, on physical, perishable, and non-perishable media. We didn't. We had, there was still technological sophistication. This is why all the written records speak from the perspective with very primitive frames of reference uh, in very mythological tones because they were, they were recorded 100, 200, and 300 years after the events they depict, after technology had completely collapsed. So there was no old re written records. Uh, let me give you an example so you understand exactly what I'm saying here. If we were destroyed today, if a cataclysm destroyed us today, there's no way 50 years from now that the survivors who've been living hand to mouth just trying to eat and sleep and, 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 and be protected from the environment and animals and each other and all that, there's no way that they could find a microfish library and be able to write books based off the data they found in there. Literacy would have collapsed. Uh, the ability to even have any type of technological apparatus to look at the microfish would not exist anymore. Um, this is just an example. I'm just using a microfish as an example. We can say VHS tapes. We can say uh, uh, we can say uh, flash drives, thumb drives. 
SD chips, it doesn't matter. The 100 years after a total systemic infrastructure collapse, there's no way to even review all the knowledge that was known and preserved 100 years earlier because that infrastructure would have preserved information very differently. There was no, there no books, none of that. We invented books way after the infrastructure collapse. And that was by a long process. We initially recorded information on clay tablets using a stylus, using, using symbols to convey thoughts. And then we burned them in kilns to harden them and preserve them. And I believe that that whole system was invented because we did not ever want to lose our knowledges again. Once we had lost all that pre-flood knowledge, there was no way to get it back except through transmission of oral tradition. It was the only way. And those oral traditions become corrupt because the frames of reference with each generation become more and more simplified. And they lose their technological veneer. So Enki was 34, 39 BC. He wasn't called Enki at the time. And 13 centuries later, when the Jews were recording everything that they found in the Babylonian annals, they had named him Enoch. It's the exact same individual. It's just two different cultures from two different time periods describing the same individual. He was a benefactor, somebody who had entered into the simulacrum history at that time to bring infrastructure, civilization, learning, agriculture, domesticated animals, everything that the people had lost by virtue of cataclysm. Yeah, right. guys, the the comments I see on don't trust books and our books, listen, that's that's you got to be new to my channel to even be asking anything like that. That's the whole that's the focus of archaics. I mean, by the time that I have revealed any information in my dissertations, I have already eliminated what I believe is the erroneous material. Yeah, I don't just because I have old books doesn't mean I believe all of them. No, it's the commonalities, it's the common denominators, the exact same tactic that I employ in my research to find all the common commonalities between different ancient texts to isolate the real from the imagined is the exact same approach that I did with Ben Davidson of Suspicious Observers. Some of y'all came into the chat thinking there was going to be a debate, there's going to be some some fire. No. Just because I'm a simulationist doesn't mean I can't entertain the value that another person brings to the table, even if I believe 100% that that value is derived through artificial sources. I don't believe that space exists. I don't believe that as we know it. I don't believe NASA's ever sent anything beyond the Van Allen belt. I don't believe we've ever been to the moon. And 100% of the scientific data is contrived. It's all the interpretation of sig sig signals. We don't have a Hubble telescope up there. If we do, it's attached to a balloon. Something I have like to that. speak up on the Book of Jasher. Because one, I'm a critic of the tiny hats. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a hell of a critic of the tiny hats because the whole Old Testament I now know is almost all fiction. So, um, But the Book of Jasher is a problem for me. Because according to rabbinical sources... The book of Jasher was written by rabbis, or, or it's an old Hebrew text. Okay, if I take that at face value, then I have an admission here by Jewish, Jewish writers a long time ago who are claim, claiming that it was Jewish writers that put the book of Jasher together. My problem stems from this. I'm a chronologist, and I've gone through the chronometrical data for civilizations that a lot of people don't even know exist. I have gone, I have so much chronological material. I have been able to put together this massive history, this chronicon, this whole sequence of events, and I've been able to show that the Phoenix phenomenon of 138 years perfectly lines up with this world history, which was also put together put together by a biblical chronologist named Stephen Jones. Our years, he doesn't know anything about the Phoenix, but our years match up everything. I'm able to cite all these scholars, even, even men a thousand years ago who left us records, who gave us the years of certain things like the flood, like the Tower of Babel, gave us the years of Abraham's birth. And I've been able to put together these data points from hundreds of different sources, different time periods in different languages, all from different source materials. And yet, it's a perfect chronology and everybody's in agreement in every way. And then the book, of, then I, I did this using hundreds of different sources. And then I have this, this problem. This problem is the book of Jasher, which I can lay out next to my chronology, and it's a 100% match. 
and it blows my mind. I've never understood it. Stephen Jones, Stephen Jones even goes into some detail about the Book of Jasher. Even the Phoenix phenomenon date of 1687 BC is perfectly, perfectly dated. So is the Great Flood. It's all there. In addition to that, so is Nemesis X object, 3439 BC. The flood in the days of Enos. It's all in the Book of Jasher. Book of Jasher goes into such historical, meticulous detail. There's over 500 chrono markers in the Book of Jasher. What I mean by a chrono marker is that it's giving you an idea of when things happen. Like, this was the 25th day. This was the 25th year of Rikaion on the you know, uh, Rikaion, since Rikaion took the throne, which was the 15th year of, of such and such. And this is a chrono marker because I can compare these with, with, with other dynasties and other deals. And when you do that, everything in the Book of Jasher matches the Archaic chronology. 100%. And Stephen Jones and all these other ones I've put together throughout the world. So I, I question, I question, did Jewish scholars do this or did they come in contact at Alexandria, Egypt with a chronology of the world that they stole and then they Hebraicized it and introduced themselves as the key players. And this is what they did with the Old Testament. This is what they did with a lot of writings in the Old Testament. So did they do it and then erase where they actually got it from? I don't know. It's a problem. Until it, 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 I, I'm, I'm totally in agreement with the, with the chronology of the book of Jasher. But we don't know of any copies that are older than like 14, 15 centuries. We just don't know. We, we do have a reference to one 2,000 years ago or 18 centuries ago in the days of Hadrian. So we do have a reference to the existence of the Book of Jasher. And we do have four different copies. The fourth one was found in Calcutta, India. So I don't know. But I do know the chronology is solid. It is solid. It's amazingly solid. I just don't know if it's actually an original Jewish uh, uh, composition or if like so many other texts that they got caught doing, did they rewrite it and then Hebraicize it? I don't know. You know, I have a saying, I have a saying I coined a long time ago, somewhere on my channel on a picture. Uh, males are many, but men are few. And that can apply to the entire race. That can apply to everybody. It's, it's uh, There is a hierarchy. I, I do not believe that that inequality. I don't believe in that in that socio political BS at all. People have shown themselves. They have shown there are people who are are empathically superior to other people, while there are people who are intellectually superior to others. There are people who are socially superior, and there are people who are superior by virtue of the very the very architecture of their personality. Just people who aren't smarter, they're not more emotional, they're not more empathic. It's just their dynamics of their personality is so genuine that they're, they just they trump everybody else around them. They are the star of the show in every room they go in, and it's not because they're smarter. It's not because they have they're wealthy. It's not. It's because of this 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 energy in them, the spiritual energy that everybody else can 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 resonate with almost upon contact. So no, we're all in equal. We're when there's we're none of us are equal. I don't believe in that at all. We all have we all have our advantages and our disadvantages. I just don't believe in the equality bullshit. I mean, I've seen evidence from the historical record and I've documented it in my Chronicon and in my videos and published books that, that sometimes whole civilizations get reset, but the neighbors next to them had no idea anything was even happening. We have historical records of United States cities documenting phenomena that was happening in their skies that their neighbors should have seen. Well, we see now that they were highly local, which is impossible because what is described would have been at such high altitude that other American cities would have had to have seen these things as well, but they didn't. Charles Fort has whole books published about similar phenomena. The highly localized uh, alteration of our holography that is perceived by whole populations, but only from the vantage point of their locality. Meaning, here's a perfect example. I'm going to give you a historical example, and I'm going to give you an illustration right now. First, the illustration. Here's an American community right here. Here's a, here's a phenomena in the sky. But this community is adjacent to a community over here and one over here. Therefore, this phenomena must be seen by them as well. But this is not what we get. 
we find that there is a shell here that stops anything from them being able to visually see what these people are going through. This has happened multiple times in the historical record. One of the greatest scenarios is 1917 called the Fatima apparitions. In 1917, thousands of people came together when these children were prophesying about Catholic prophecies on the future and all that. I don't know all the details, but I do have the account. I was going to do a video about it, but there's a... uh, We have the phenomena of these thousands of people coming together and then the sun itself began to act erratic in the sky and it changed positions twice. And then in the middle of the day, it suddenly at high velocity went down. Listen, what those people saw, thousands of people together all expecting to see a divine omen uh, mentioned by this child about events coming in the future. All these people got together and they saw this. Thousands of people documented it. it. It was entered into the historical record as a fact that this was experienced in 1917. The problem is, is the sun had to have been highly local or their little reality tunnel, call it a pocket, call it whatever, had been, had been completely encapsulated in a hollow field that reflected the real reality to everybody else. It's called cloaking. It cloaked, something cloaked the phenomena, making them see all this, but really nothing changed in the sky. The sun kept moving where it was supposed to go. Day and night still occurred. None of that happened. But to the highly local area, the sun acted erratically and then shot back down and it became night. Absolutely impossible, but everybody saw it and recorded it. So this tells me that this is a basically observer-controlled holography. It's an observer-controlled universe. And it also explains why we have so many historical records of absolutely weird and horrific events that are recorded from the sky for which no one else saw nor said anything about. In the 1800s, we have so many American cities that reported these strange black clouds that appeared directly over the settlements and communities and issued in red dust, red mud, and red lightning issued from these dark clouds. And there were really weird geomagnetic storms. And sometimes people disappeared and sometimes actual physical rocks appeared falling from the sky. And they were always highly local because other, other cities and other communities did not see these things. This has happened over and over and over. Even the great star over Slovenge, Norway in 1752 was, was local. It was local. It's an octagonal star. It was an eight-sided star. This giant super construction in the sky appeared. Many communities, many communities in Norway saw it. For miles in each direction, all these farmsteads, all these communities, small villages, even a city, they all saw it. And they recorded it in 1752. The problem is the rest of the world should have saw it as well, unless it was highly local. Yeah, same thing, 1561. 1561 had this great war in the sky. The sky sim failed. People saw what was really there. Uh, It was over Nuremberg. Strangely, it happened again in 1566. Yeah. And then over Ohio in the year 1890, half the population of Ohio sees a city floating in the sky. But if Ohio saw it, there's too many other states that are too close by, but no one else recorded it. So we have a problem. We have something that has the ability to cloak phenomena, aerial phenomena. It can cloak this phenomena. So if something has the capability of cloaking phenomena to make it only seen from a certain perspective, and this is technological, we're no longer talking about natural phenomena. We're talking about high technology being employed against humans. That's 100%. Okay, first of all, I believe everything in the sky is simulated. Now, this heliocentric system that we have is a construct that was specifically built by humans. But you have to understand how the simulacrum reacts to the human human consciousness. When a collective of people believe that the system is that way, the simulacrum then begins to produce the phenomena that will fulfill that belief. This is what has happened. 
So when Copernicus and Galileo, they put forth these models of what the solar system looks like and all that, other astronomers are searching for evidence of that 100 years later. And through their telescopes, they document that they saw this and this and this. Therefore, this, this must be true. So they document that. After a while, we have a we have a astronom uh, an astronaut Royal Astronomical Society that has minutes going back 150 years. And when when uh, other astronomers, kid, you know, you know, kids being raised in university, read all this stuff and they read the new textbooks and they read all the new scientific findings. In their minds, they put together, oh, okay, so Jupiter must have 27 moons. Oh, Saturn must have rings. Oh, Uranus and Neptune switch places. They're, they're not always at the same place. Okay, the further out the gas giants are, the more they deviate from the plane of the ecliptic. Okay, when all these things are decided and other people agree to it, then it's published as fact, the simulacrum reciprocates. Then new a new generation of astronomers, they study in their telescopes, and what do they see? Saturn has rings. What do they discover? Oh, wow, Neptune and, 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 and Uranus, they do switch places. 1877, Asaph Hall published, published that Mars had two moons. In 1877, no one had ever seen two moons on Mars before. But because he published that and everybody believed it, astronomers right after that found Deimos and Phobes two Mars of moons, but Mars had been studied for over a century and no one had ever seen those moons. This is, this is an enigma that's mentioned in many mystery books about astronomy, but I'm telling you now, it's not a mystery because the simulacrum will produce whatever phenomena that is projected into it. And when the scientific establishment puts out all this material about what's out there in space and the collective begin to believe it, the simulacrum responds by producing that optical phenomena for the next generation of astronomers to actually discover those things in telescopes. This is what's been happening over and over and over and over. This is why it's dangerous. It's really dangerous to, to believe everything the scientific establishment puts out. But it's even more dangerous to believe ABC, e, uh, NBC, CBS, all mainstream media. That's why it's absolute poison to believe them. Because the world we live in isn't the world that they convey. But it becomes the world they convey because we believe them. I ain't talking about errants. I'm not talking about the rebels. I'm not talking about free thinkers. I'm talking about the collective. Because remember, even if... Even if Archaics had 250,000 subscribers, we would still be an extreme minority in the world population, not able to affect it, only affect our own individual informed fields, only to build our own world inside this bigger world. In following the Phoenix destructions, it's very, very obvious to me that in the 1800s, we got too big for our britches, and we were excelling and moving way too fast, and that something happened. Something had nothing to do with the Phoenix phenomenon, because there are other cataclysm protocols, and something happened in the, in the 1800s, basically an, an edit. Just an, an edit that very difficult to, to get through all the material. I, I have more videos on the 1800s coming out. Um, Something happened in the 18, 1800s to retard human development because we were moving too fast. But it was, but it was a the retardation was only a temporary, like a thirty or forty year setback. By 1902, civilization was ready to move forward again. But it was like this: it was like everybody was holding their breath. The elite were in hiding; they were gone. And then when it was when when it was over with, and when when all this red red mud, red rain, and red dust fallout happened all over the world, especially in Australia and the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, when all this happened throughout the world in 1902, but nothing really major happened as far as, I mean, for those of you who don't know, the red mud and red dust and red, red rain fallout happens almost every year somewhere in the world. But on Phoenix years, like 1902, 1764, 1626, it happens worldwide. That's what happened in 1902. 1902, 1902. This stuff, this stuff almost capsized ships. It was a, uh, it just, it just flooded from the sky. It just rained from the sky. Sometimes, depending upon the the local humidity, it was either dust, sand, or mud. Sometimes it was just red rains. But it was tested. It was it was noted by many scientists in 1902, especially in Rome, that it resembled blood corpuscles. They thought they thought that it was organic. A lot. I mean, it was organic. It was 35 to 65 percent organic materials, depending upon which samples were tested. 
So I tell you guys all the time, our skies are not what you think. Our skies are a beautiful hologram. They are hiding immense machinery. And I have come to the conclusion of machinery, because you guys know, those who have been watching my channel for a while, there are things in the historical record that are absolutely inexplic inexplicable unless we unless we just agree that, okay, our sky is not real and it's hiding something else, something that, like a machine, has cargo holds and it just drops. It just I'm talking about just drops all kinds of materials on our world, like the insect plagues of the 1860s and 70s. That's just one example. Or 1347, the Great Black Death Plague, when body parts were raining from the sky that were putrefied, and, and it's what caused the, 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 the plague that killed one-third of the entire human race. Yeah, it wasn't rats on ships from China. That's the historical uh, uh, gloss over. That's what you get today. Fleas on rats from chip from China. That's not what happened. We there there are many historical accounts from that period, and I only and I cite them in my video. And even better, you can go to Gods of Eden by William Bramley, a military historian, and he cites even more sources explaining that look, man, these people saw cigar-shaped objects in the sky. Their bellies opened up and dumped body parts of moose and cows and elk and goats and raccoons, and they were putrid, and they had been all chopped up. It's like they took all the forest animals, run them through a blender, and then just let them mulch for about two or three weeks until it was so poisonous and, and full, and full of uh, putrid decay, and then dumped them all over the forest, and that's where the Black, the black Death Plague spread from. There's machines in our sky. Those aren't UFOs. Giant cigar-shaped objects that act with intelligence, but they're only performing functions. Yeah, the sky is full of stuff. In 1566 and in 1561 or two different years where the sky holography collapsed and people saw what was really there. So 1752 uh, might have been an incident like that too with the giant octagonal star. I've done a video about that one. So yeah, there's definitely machinery in our skies. There's no doubt about it. It's not anything that we think that, that we think it is. The dark satellite actually alters the programming of our world. It does some really weird stuff. It was here in 1899 BC. It di it did the Babel incident. It it also altered now the calendars from 360 days to 364. That's a major edit. It's a super major edit to every every culture in the world to change its calendar. Yeah, it's crazy. All the for those of you who don't know, all the oldest calendars, none of them were predicated on 365.25 days. None of them. They were all divisible. The, all the Vedic yugas, every single yuga uh, is divisible by 360. Every Sumerian epic is divisible by 360. The 432,000 uh, shars of the Babylonian dynasty of the of the kings before the flood is all divisible by 360. All 13 Bactons of the Mayan long counts 1,872,000 days, which ends in 2046, is divisible by 360. None of these old calendar systems were divisible by 365.25. None of them. None of them were even divisible by 365. So, it's a the dark satellite is a super construction. It appears in the sky, and it's like it's like an interference pattern. It like it's almost as if it rewrites the coding for everything going on in the world, and it and it creates division and separation. It actually retards human development. The dark satellite is a uh, it's pretty harrowing, and the, its next return is 2052. So for me to find all these weird patterns, the 138 years which is recorded in history, it's the Phoenix, it's the Phoenix chronology which the ancient Jews called the angel of death. Uh, the Chinese called the Fink. Uh, uh, I mean, it has so many different names. The Norse called it the Fenris. It eats the sun and moon. It's all the same thing. Um, uh, it's called Noth in ancient China in ancient Egypt, but Noth, but you understand just like the goddess, the goddess Neith is the Greek goddess Athene, but the Egyptian, the Egypt, but in Egyptian, it's, a, it's, a uh, what's her name? Oh my God, I'm out of brain for it. All these Egyptian deities, when they're when you see them spelled inversely or in reverse, in reverse, those are the Greek names of the gods. But that's not a mystery. That's not even that has nothing to do with with, with uh, simulation theory at all. It has everything to do with the fact that one culture wrote from right to left and one culture wrote from left uh, left to right. 
So when they were writing, they conveyed the idea of text linearly like they're supposed to. But when they got to the pronoun pronouns, they just flipped them over. So that's uh, that's that's why we got that. The dark satellite returns in 2052. It's going to bring with it the seven kings. The seven kings are the subject matter of the beast, the beast empire. They they will return at the height of the apocalypse. Okay, well, we're going back to the ancient faith again of the Christos. Those Phoenicians, which are Israelites, Phoenician, Phoenician art, one, one of the common sigils, religious symbols that a lot of Phoenician sailors had around their neck was an emblem of bronze or copper, or if they're of the nobility, silver. It was of a pyramid with a little smiley face where the chief cornerstone goes. This was, these have actually been found. Now, this was the faith in the, the stone the builders rejected. It was the faith that God was going to put back the world and the government of the world the way it is supposed to only once the monument of man is complete. Every single block in the Great Pyramid, millions of blocks, each one represents a redeemed soul of man. Someone who has made it all the way through the kingdom of Seeker and the gates of Rostow. Meaning that they are pure. They have been seen as holy and they have been accepted. They have been plucked from the fire. The little smiley face on the capstone is this deity, this Christos, this united one, this benefactor who's going to put it all together. But as it stands today, the Great Pyramid is, has a flat top. It has no, it's never had a capstone. So uh, those of you un, my new, new to my channel and unfamiliar with this line, it's a, this is the subject matter of my book, The Lost Scriptures of Giza. This is my very first public book, published book, where I show all these ancient, mystic, hermetic, and occult traditions that are attached to the idea of the Great Pyramid being the greatest religious symbol this world has ever seen, what it truly means. And uh, that was my first book, and it secured me multiple uh, uh, publishing contracts with Booktree. That's a hard question to answer because it will require us to go into a lot of academic material about the migrations out of the Levant, Palestine, the original identity of the ancient Israelites, Balaam in the groves, the, the worship of Ashtoreth, uh, the tree rings set all throughout Bashan, Argob, and Canaan. Uh, you guys, the, the Druids, the Druids were an order of priests that was openly acknowledged that they had come from an older culture, older than the very Celts that had basically revered them. The Druids were, were considered Celt because they had become Celt. They had been assimilated. But the, the order of the Druids, the order of the Oak Men, they come basically from Canaan. And I believe that they were brought basically all the way into, into Europe through uh, Israelite migrations of the Danan, variously called Tuatha Day Danan, the Danu, uh, peoples of the goddess Danu. Uh, it's, they had so many different names. They, you know, they, 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 they named the Danube River, and about 400 different European cities all have D-I-N, D-E-N, uh, D-E-N-N, D-A-N, uh, all different deals. All throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the Old Testament, there are references to one of the Israelite branches being called called the, the people of Dan. There were a mariner race. But their their chief priests were of the groves. That's why every island, every island they went to, every every uh, coast that they went to, they built these elaborate tree rings, and uh, that's what they did. I mean, uh, the Dru these are the oak men. These are these is the origin of the traditions of the green man all throughout Europe. The druids were were were. Uh, I wish I could remember the name. Taylorson, uh, the the Celt the Celt druids. And the people of Gaul, I mean, these were basically the same people, two different cultures. We're talking about the difference between the people of Texas and the people of New York. That's, well, I, I shouldn't have said New York. But, uh, yeah, New York's fundamentally different than Texas. But, basically, we're talking about the further back in time you look, the more the Celts bleed into the Gauls. 
bleed into the Franks, bleed into the Burgundians. They bleed. They bleed into the Jutes. They bleed not the Jews, the Jutes. They, they bleed into the the Saxons. The more the more you research European history, if you were to peel off century after century, as if the the layers of centuries were an onion, the further you go back, you find a core people with a with a priesthood, a governing priesthood, and they go back to the Mediterranean. And then when you when you study those people and find out that they all exited ports in Ionia, ancient Milesia, and then you find out they they made stops in Crete and all. On the, on the coast of France, how they went around because they had enemies in Italia, uh, ancient Italy. When you, when you go back and find these, these old Ionian, Ionian uh, uh, navigators, we find out they're all coming from Byblos. They're all coming from Kadesh. They're all coming from uh, all these massive migrations are all coming from, uh, was it Kadesh, Byblos, Ugarit, Bashan, uh, Mari, they're all coming from the very areas of the ancient world that, according to the Old Testament, were occupied by different families of the Israelites. So it's a it's a very intense study. It's, it's very complex. It involves a lot of, of material. It's it's just something that can't be done in a, in a q and It's something that has to be an actual upload, a real presentation where we where we cite the sources and the facts. But the Druids originally the more you the more you study them they came straight out of basically the amu the amuru the amorite settlements that later became known in the old testament as the land of israel but uh unfortunately for the east the phoenix the phoenix this time it's it, it's going to be bad for china it's going to be bad for central asia and it's going to be bad all the way from central asia to the borders of to the borders of india that's where the Phoenix is going to focus this time. It's going to be the East. Uh, it's going to be bad for them. There are going to be places. There are going to be places in Europe and Asia that absolutely are are bypassed like a Passover. There's just nothing going to happen. They, they might see some visual fallout, but that's about it. Uh, New York City, London, and several coastal cities. They're going to they're going to have problems. New York might be taken out. This is inferred in Nostradamus's prophecies. Uh, it's also heavily inferred in the fact that. Uh, 2040 is 414 years after New York or, or the area was purchased by the Dutch from the Manhattan Indians. That's very relevant. There is a guy named Stephen Jones who wrote a book named Secrets of Time where he documents hundreds of incidents from history where the number 414 was evidently a part of a curse. And uh, he shows this very convincing book. What he didn't know was 414 was three phoenix visitations it's 138 times three he didn't know that 138 wasn't even on stephen jones radar when he published this book about all these anomalies throughout human history that were all 414 years apart so if he would have been digging a little bit deeper he may have eventually discovered that the true number is 138 now uh all throughout history three is the number of totality so we have 138 which is Phoenix visitations times the number for something that is, has become full total. Remember in eschatology, it is a very fundamental tenet in eschatology that the oversoul does not visit judgment on civilizations until their cup is full. This is a very old symbol all throughout the old Testament. And the symbol is revisited in a, and symbol is revisited in the book of Revelation when the bowls of wrath are finally full. They're not poured back onto the world during the apocalypse until they're full. So there are instances in the Old Testament where people are crying and praying, saying, hey, man, how come you, you're not bringing judgment on these people here? That, that? And the angels tell those people that the sins of such and such, such and such are not yet full. Well, by saying full is, is giving us back the imagery of the cup, the container, or the bowl, which is used in the apocalyptic literature of the book of Revelation. So, so evidently, 414 or 414 years is a window of opportunity for, for the oversoul to visit judgment on something. And in this case, New York City is 414 years old in, in 2040. So I do believe... I do believe that uh, New York City is going to be taken out, but the rest of the United States are going to be, going to be pretty much fine, except for some coastal regions. 
uh, UK, coastal regions, London, London should be taken out. European cities on the coast. I, I, I do think that uh, that uh, Vienna will be taken out. Um, just the coastal cities, but the actual Phoenix fallout, which is harrowing, which is the, this horn blast from the sky, this vibration, this vibrating, vibrating the earth to such intensity that organic materials like people, squirrels, deer, hogs, dogs, whatever, they, they can't stay on the ground anymore because the ground literally liquefies from vibration. It's like turning solid concrete into quicksand. You just sink into it and you can't get out. And then when the horn blast stops, all once once all that vibration is over with, it, it's returned instantly to a solid state. So we, we have an entire civilization that, that can become fossilized in this way very quickly. So, it's uh, yeah, the Phoenix fallout for 2040 is going to be concentrated in the east. The west is going to get a, the west is going to get a pass. Six point six years later, that pass will be over with. Because then it's going to be the Nemesis X object. And remember, guys, these aren't these aren't just arbitrary dates. You have to be familiar with the data in Chronicon to understand how these dates are derived. You have to understand that the 138-year Phoenix Protocol goes back thousands of years is very well documented. You have to understand that these are the elements in many different cultures' prophecies. This is what they were talking about. I mean, even Nostradamus ingeniously hid date date indexes in his own quatrains. And when they were discovered, it shocked me about what it said, what was going to happen to the world in 2040. It's all about the Phoenix. And then when I found, then when then when Caesar Ramadi published Nostradamus's private letters to his own son and to the king of, of France, I couldn't believe it. I cited those in my published books and I even read them in some of my uh, Phoenix videos. It's astonishing. Nostradamus not only knew about the Phoenix, knew it was going to come back, knew knew that the Phoenix was going to bring some vast destruction, but he also mentioned the year 1901. He was one year off. You, my friend, have not listened to the Giza playlist, The Lost Secrets of Giza, because had you have listened to those older videos, you would have had the answer to that question. I will dignify you with an abbreviated answer right now. But I am telling you that the Great Pyramid of what it contains is so valuable as a template of the architecture of the holography itself. It was so well hidden and for so long because the other two pyramids are decoys. And from the beginning, everybody thought the whole complex was the focus. And it's not. You need to watch those videos and see those ancient citations and what has been known by prior generations about that. There's only one true pyramid in the entire world. All the others are false. Even the second pyramid, which looks to you in photographs to be the same size, is not. It's nowhere near the size of the actual Great Pyramid because it's on a raised limestone plateau platform. And it's very cleverly concealed. They changed their uh, <coughs> um, identities, all that. We have, in the Native American tradition, traditions, there's many different trickster gods, but it's all inky. Uh, in, the, in the Norse, Icelandic, uh, in the Northern European, it's Loki. Um, but inky, Loki, I think it's White Rabbit, uh, some, in the story of Smoking Mirror, I believe there's an appearance of, uh, of Enki. In the ancient Sumerian text, just like there's two e Enochs in the book of Genesis, in the, in the Near Eastern records of the pre-flood world, there are also two Demuzis. Um, yeah, but and the, and the person of Enoch being, being Enki, that's not even a hard sell. I mean, there's so many parallels between them. Uh, I have, one of my videos goes into all the Sumerian data that we have about a knowledge of the Great Pyramid and what it was. Yeah, I have a video about that. It's deep. It goes in, I go into break down the Sumerian terms and show you guys these people knew about the Great Pyramid and they knew it was far away. And uh, yeah, the you know, here's here's where a lot of the disinformation comes. 
people read people read these books about the Sumerian uh, the modern books about Sumerian interpretations like Zechariah Sitchin and and uh, there's a lot a lot of them that came out in the 70s 80s 90s thousands even today <clears throat> but they're not reading Maureen Gallery Kovacs they're not they're not reading Samuel Noah Kramer they're not reading George Smith they're not reading Thor Heyerdahl. They're not reading the people who actually knew what the Sumerians were talking about. They're reading all this new new ancient aliens interpret interpreted material, which is very different. The cuneiform texts sound very different when they're read from a perspective of somebody who's trying to push an ancient aliens narrative. But when you read them from their original perspectives and you, and you listen to the original Sumerologist, Kramer, all these people who knew what they were talking about when they were translating these records, you will find a totally different story unfolding about what was going on in the people who were called Anuna, who were later demonized by the Babylonians and called Anunnaki. They didn't come from the sky at all. So, <clears throat> this person, Enki, was just human. And the pictures of him show a human. And I don't know why these ancient alien theorists don't get that. It shows bearded, tall humans among the, among the people of Sumer. But the Sumerians themselves were what? They were smooth-skinned people of short stature. And they venerated these Anuna, who were tall, bearded, round-eyed. This is why the statues of these people, of the Anuna and Anunnaki, are goggle-eyed because it's the exact same thing that people of the Far East do when they're representing Caucasians. When they show Caucasians in their art, they always show them with big eyes. And when Westerners show Asiatic people, Oriental people in their art, they show them with, with squinted eyes. They show them with slant eyes. It's always in the artwork and over. It's basically, it's basically an exaggeration of the features. We find this in the Sumerian in the statues. All these Sumerian statues that describe the Anuna and all these Sumerian gods, Shows all it shows them. They use lapis lazuli, lazuli for their for the eyes, which is a blue mineral compound. They always put lapis lazuli in their eyes to show blue eyes, and they show these long beards. Guys, that's not an alien. That's a human. It's so. It's a. I mean, even the very fact, even the very fact, even from the ancient aliens context, the very fact that the Anuna could actually interbreed with the normal stock humans shows that we're only dealing with humans. We're not dealing with anything supernatural. We're not dealing with fallen angels. We're not dealing with any of that, any of that stuff man, that, was, that was created way later and is not in the original records. All, all the religionist Babylonian origin crap that was made up after that. <coughs> so yeah, <coughs> Inky was just a guy. Enoch is the Jewish version of that guy. But the Jewish version wasn't written till over a thousand years, way after that history was already pretty much dead. And it was only read in old Babylonian libraries. Oh, yes, I believe you could walk. I believe there's huge areas you could walk. I mean, think about it. I have a video where I show the evidence that the ancient Dravidians of India walked to northern Australia. And then after the collapse of the vapor canopy, that area of the world flooded out. When it flooded out, there was no way to get back. So 4,500 years later, the Dravidians of northern, uh, I mean, the Dravidians of southern India maintained their culture over thousands of years, slight deviations and changes. But the peop the Dravidians that were isolated in northern Australia spread out through Australia because they're trapped there now. There was no way back to India, and they, they devolved into the Australian Bushmen. They lost their culture, but the ancient Dravidian artifacts have been found in Australia. And the fact that they look very, very similar, and they're basically the only two peoples in the world that even look that way. You know, yeah, it's all, I have a pretty good video about that. 
uh, that similarity. But yes, I do believe that there was areas all over the world. I mean, that's this is what we get. When, this is what the archaeology shows. We know that the ancient city, basalt city of Metallinan, in, in the Isle of Yap, way out in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific, was not built half submerged under the Pacific. We know that the 550-something statues of Moya, the gigantic heads on Easter Island, could have never been built on an island the size of Easter Island today. It must have been much bigger and connected to a much bigger uh, chain of islands. We know that the traditions uh, of the people of Micronesia, in Melanesia, in Polynesia, in Oceania are very specific that all of their islands used to be bigger and some of the smaller islands were giant islands. Yeah, from a canoe, in a canoe at one time, they could cross the entire Pacific. Yeah, there was no voyages by, by land. It was just canoe hopping, it was just island hopping all the way from the Asia to the Americas. Can't do that today, but back then they say you could. So, <clears throat> yeah, during the vapor canopy, during the vapor canopy, all the moisture was in the was in the mesosphere. When all the moisture was in the mesosphere, Antarctica had no ice, no snow. There was more land. There was more land in the Pacific. There was more land in the Mediterranean. There was more land in the Atlantic. All these areas, all these areas were traversable. There are underground ruins everywhere. There's 300 stone cities underwater in the Mediterranean alone. And now, human places of human occupation and ancient shorelines have now been detected in, underwater in the Black Sea. Taking the just these few things into consideration, just these few things. There's so much more to consider, like the ruins off Japan, the ruins off India, the ruins off, off the UK. Listen, there's so many things to consider. If we just take just these things to consider, the vapor canopy pulls the moisture into the, into the mesosphere, which domes over the world. It's thick, thick. It's like a lens at night. It magnifies the stars. It keeps the atmosphere. It builds atmospheric pressure. It pulls the moisture off the surface of the world, so there's only small seas and lakes everywhere. Then there comes a tipping point when the mesosphere can no longer maintain that integrity, and it collapses. And when it does, you get 40 to 130 days worth of rain. It floods, the whole world floods, but the whole world isn't flooded. A lot of areas are still, there's survivors everywhere. So... <clears throat> when that collapse occurs, the atmospheric pressure drops. The oxygen intake is it, it diminishes tremendously. So mammals are, are the survivors, and reptiles and amphibians have to have to stop growing to large sizes because they don't have the oxygen anymore. Plants no longer have the, uh, the, the, the carbon monoxide and the nitrogen. They no, they no longer have the things they need, so they grow to the, to the sizes we know them today. When this happens, the poles, whatever, it doesn't matter if you're a flat earther or, or, or whatever, the polar extremities now acquire the ice packs rapidly, the snow. They're not doing that now. Less than an inch of snow happens in the Arctic and the Antarctic now a year because those areas are not are not humid they're very very dry so we have rapid the, the the poles rapidly get buried it's not like the uniformitarians say and the glaciologists and and those who promote the whole bogus ice age theories which are totally untrue none of that's true guys this this whole Ice Age theory was built on a whole bunch of false premises that totally ignore, ignore the vapor canopy techniques. But what I find interesting is one of the greatest proofs in the 1800s that the Ice Ages were real was the fact that woolly mammoths and woolly rhinoceroses are among the hundreds of millions of life forms that are found packed in the permafrost, frozen solid. It must have been cold back then because we found them in ice. It must have been cold back then because they're covered in hair. Guys, if you know anything about 
anything whatsoever about mammalian biology, you will know that among the hairiest creatures in the entire world are all in jungles and deserts. Yeah, guys, nothing these people have told us is true about these ice ages. It's all BS. And now we have, we have all kinds of biologists that have come forth in the last 30 years publishing all these reports that the hair on the woolly mammoths actually cooled them. What do they need to be cooled for if they're already in the Arctic? So, yeah, guys, none of it makes sense. The tulips, undigested tulips on their mouths, the mushrooms that have been found in their hoofs that are frozen. Yeah, none of it makes sense, guys. They were living in a very warm climate when suddenly they were frozen solid. I did not hear that, but that right there is evidence, evidence of what I have been conveying for the past three years. And not only, not only I, but, but one of my videos I cite four different books from the 1920s, 30s, 50s, and 70s about the return of the vapor canopy. Yeah, this isn't something I made up, guys. There, there's real science behind this, and it's attached to volcanoes. And the phoenix throughout history is the main agitator that makes the most volcanoes go off at the same time. And, and from what this, man, what this man just said in a, in a, in a comment is evidence of what I've been telling you. He just said that the moisture content in the atmosphere increased because of recent volcanic activity. Yeah, guys, that's amazing. It's amazing. Doesn't take much to create a vapor canopy because once that vapor canopy is there, it's going to be there for a while before something causes it to collapse. Um, the Fe Listen, the Phoenix phenomenon, it's a... Uh, it's mid-May. It's you know it's it's the it's the beginning of May that uh I'm, excuse me it's the middle of May that the Phoenix phenomenon occurs. And that period of time is attached to European folklore and traditions. The Maypole, you know, uh, some people say May Day, Beltine, and all that. But remember, guys, the calendar has been shifted two months. Remember. September, October, November, and December are not the ninth, tenth, and are they're not the seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth month. But that's how they're named: Septi is seven, Octo's eight, Novi nine, Deci ten. So, in our calendar today, the last four months are not the seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth. They are the ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth months. There's been a shift. The ancient New Year was the beginning of March. It was the beginning of March, guys. So. This places, this places the Phoenix phenomenon on the ancient calendar as being the second month. It would be March, April, May. Yeah, it was two, two and a half months into the calendar. So uh, I'm uh, two and a half months into, into the old new year is where we have these unusual festivals. And even in the satanic holidays, we have these sacrificial dates. Uh, basically uh, employing what was called substitute, substitute, what was it, substitute, uh, the law of substitution. It's when, in ancient times, they knew that a certain disaster would occur on a certain date because it, it always happened with regularity. So they would pick someone who was going to be the substitute, a.k.a. the scapegoat. And they would lay all the sins of the people on this victim. And then they would sacrifice this victim in hopes that the predicted and cyclical disasters did not occur. I would never be able to prove yea or nay on the topic of animals because we interact with them. We believe they have a modicum of intelligence. They're, they're empathic. They respond to us emotionally. We can never know if that's pure programming or if it's real. I would like to think that they are a, a sentient being, meaning that they have a soul that's on the outside of the construct and that they are, they too are growing. There's no, there's nowhere in, I mean, there's no one to ever say that we ourselves did not begin as they are. We could have begun as a much more primitive soul. 
we could have we could have evolved from the animal kingdom uh, like you know in soul form way before we took on a human avatar and then once we entered the human avatar realm we remained humans the same thing applies for when we leave here will we be human in another construct or something greater and yet will that greatness be well, will it pall in comparison to something even more majestic in a far future simulacrum experience where we're living life sims out in a totally different holography, in a totally different historical routines and subroutines and edits and resets? Yeah, we just don't know. This is something that is pure speculation. It was nothing, there was never, these type of questions I would never be able to assert with any confidence uh, what the answer would be about animals. I suspect that they have souls, and I suspect that that means that, who knows, 200 life sims into the future, that dog that I love right now may be a human. If the simulation broke, I believe that your real eyes would open. And that you're probably in a room with four, four to you know, four to six other bodies lying in stasis, who are probably hooked up to some type of devices to make sure your vital signs are okay. And there's probably one ten, one tenant, uh, attendant that comes in and checks everybody's monitors and screens. And I believe that as soon as this simulation collapses, you'll just open up your eyes, be where you are, and your memories will be intact, and you will get up and remember who you really are. And you will sit up, and you'll see other people you're in the simulation with, and you will realize, holy shit, it's only been eight and a half hours, and I just lived through 91 lifetimes. Yeah, the time dilation's real. I believe that once technology entered into our reality, it's absolute proof that technology is in every reality. The only importance and power attached to a sigil is the one that you define. You have to understand, when it comes to it, everything in, in existence has an informed field. Your informed field happens to be attached to an immortal. Your informed field is very capable of modifying the physical world around you. But Every object, this pen has an informed field. What I mean by that is in the holosphere, there is a field, a mathematical field attached to this pen that if somebody knew what they were doing, they could read that pen and know that it's been in the possession of Jason for this long. It came into this, his possession in this way. The field would have information of being in a warehouse for a long period of time, of being in transit with 400 other pins in a box going down the highway. The informed field, if it could be read, would explain all the way to its creation when it was put, for, put together from multiple different parts. Those individual parts have their own informed fields. In the in the holo field, those individual parts would say where they came from. What and this is this is this is what our reality is constructed of. It is a mathematical construct. And when you take you know when you Im basically impute any type of importance to a certain symbol, that certain symbol absorbs that importance. It becomes that importance. But then it's, it's left. It's it's up to you to do something with it. You inject your power in the very things that you give attention to. Now, I'm, I'm speaking about things way beyond sigils, way beyond sigils and symbols. It's basically power flows where attention goes. So this was an old concept that was very understood when these when these rituals and these symbols and these effigies were done. Like it's you know it's a very old tradition from the Neolithic times that when a family was hungry they would send their hunters out and their hunters would find a secluded place where they would not be interrupted and they would hold and they would hold a cardinal ceremony. Four hunters would be at, at north, south, east, and west. And one of them would take an arrow out of his quiver, and he would draw a circle in the sand. Then he would pray to the Great Spirit and thank the Great Spirit in front of the other three witnesses, north, east, south. And he would sit there and, and thank the Great Spirit that they, that they uh, uh, got an antelope that day. He would draw an antelope, take out his, his bow, and he would shoot the antelope. If the arrow hit the antelope, 
they would they would they would brush a line in the circle because the only way to 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 materialize the antelope which was only an imagination was to let it go so it could appear in the real world to the indian the antelope didn't exist out there to be shot with an arrow until he first thanked the great spirit for it that illustration it's from the Neolithic times. It's ancient. It worked so many thousands, hundreds of thousands of times. This was their method of hunting. This is what they did. They had faith that the material antelope would appear and die on the arrow and be caught only because they performed the ritual to the great spirit. So you take that and apply that to everything in life. It had nothing to do with the antelope. It had nothing to do with the arrow, the bow, the ring, or the, the effigy that was drawn onto the ground. It had nothing to do with the, with the ancient Native Americans or Central Asian steppe Cossacks that used to perform these rituals. It had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with one individual immortal soul believing that this was the means by which to exercise power over the material world. And this is what would happen. And once that was understood and believed and a ritual was carried out, the simulacrum itself was programmed to produce the exact phenomena that was expected of it. This is what you need to understand about symbols and sigils. It has nothing to do with the material, the physical world. It has everything to do with the projector, which is you.